a number of years ago. I was speaking at a university here in the LA Basin. It was a series of youth worker conferences that they had put together, and they always asked me to come and teach on the nature of Jesus. Well, at a lunch gathering, they got all of the speakers together for us to get to know each other. Well, then they did what I always kind of hate to have happen. Would you stand up and tell us who you are and what you do? And I have trouble with that because I don't quite know what I do. <laughs> but sure enough, the first guy stands up, I'm so-and-so, I'm in charge of the western half of the United States. Next guy stands up, and of course, it's a can you top this session. Well, I'm so-and-so, and I'm in charge of the entire United States. Of course, the next guy gets up, I'm so-and-so, I'm in charge of the world. You know? And you might know the next guy's in charge of the universe. And then they came to me. And I stood up and I said, well, I'm Gail Irwin, and I lip sync for the voice of God. Well, they all fell apart. Hey, that's pretty good. Let them sing for the voice of God. Yeah. But I wasn't kidding. The fact of the matter is, in 1 Peter chapter 4, that's exactly what it tells us we do. Listen to this. As each one, this is verse 10, has received a gift. And how many is each one, by the way? Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In other words, you're taking proper care and distribution of the many folded grace of God. And each one of us has kind of a facet of his grace that if I don't get to see what God has given you, then I'm a little bit less than what I could have known about the grace of God. And so the capabilities that he gives us and the anointing that he gives us permits us to open additional facets, many, many folds of the grace of God. It's good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. What do you think that means? You're the mouthpiece of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This segment of time is devoted to how to make the Bible come alive, how to teach in ways that will cause people to listen and to remember. Now, one of the first things that God taught me is that if I'm to successfully communicate to people, then I have to remember as you read in Hebrews that the high priest was taken from among the people and never ever get to, though this is an elevated position, feel that I am elevated, see that all I am is just a guy with a mouth. In fact, I'm a mouth with a man built around it. And so God then puts me in a position to teach others, not because I am more spiritual. I've been a pastor long enough and been around them long enough to know that God did not put us where we were because we were sweet. But because he says, ooh, a mouth, I can use it. And so here we are. So you learn, I learn that if I would always keep what I would call the humble position of remembering that I am one of them. I am not elevated and never, ever, ever, ever talk down to people. Never patronize them. In fact, one of the things that, oh, I can't tell you how incredibly important, how, how significantly he impressed it upon me that my job was to love them in his place. To love them so much that the job would be for me, do I stay up here and talk or do I rush down there and hug them? 
And so with the gift God gives me, my job then is to truly love the people. And I believe he's made me to be a teacher. Therefore, I love you by teaching, you see. Now, he happens also to have blessed me with some understandings of certain communication techniques that I consider to be teaching with the ability, being good stewards with the ability that God provides. And I want to share some of that with you. Let me start off with your body. Now, none of us get up. Of course, this is a day of tapes. We don't need you anymore. We, we've become tapeworms. We don't read books much anymore. But the fact is, you stand up in front of people and your body has things to say, whether you realize it or not. The first thing that I do is I investigate when I go into a new place and see which architectural problems, which barriers am I going to have to overcome? What are the walls that I'll have to get around? Now, sometimes I've, I've preached in places, I'll never forget a certain church up in Canada. The church was a couple of hundred years old, I think. It was older than Canada, I believe. <laughs> and uh, the pulpit was way up, you, nosebleed area. And it was very tight. You come in it, and there was this much space around it. And I always ask for a lapel mic, and the reason for that is because it is a means of getting around walls. Have you noticed where I'm standing? I happen to be a guy that does not fall in love with pulpits. I consider them to be a wall that we hide behind, don't we? Well, if I don't hide behind it, they'll see my, my knees knocking, you know. Well, look at it this way. If you are really loving people, your knees aren't going to knock. I mean, it's like, I can't wait to share this with you. This is going to bless you so much. It blessed me first. I got to share this with you. And if that's your attitude, it's not a, oh, I got to teach you people. <laughs> so I look for walls and try to get around them. And one of the first things I try to get around, it's just something that the Lord has helped me discover is a pulpit so that I am not behind that. I figure if my speaking is going to expose you, then I need to be exposed to you. And that keeps you from being patronized and keeps you from me from taking advantage of you in any way. That way you can relax, you see. Another method that is a wall can be a microphone. Another thing, it, there is something about a, a microphone can be like a doctor's stethoscope. Oh, look, he's got the microphone. And so I figured, well, let's not even worry about microphones. And that's why I like lapel mics. Another thing that is a wall, a barrier, is our clothing. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but when there are people highly dressed talking to one another, they tend to be very formal. Because that tie, in addition to being a trick of the devil, <laughs> is a barrier. <laughs> it's a wall, you see. And uh, I, I got to tell you this story very quickly. I was, I can't believe I did this. I was teaching at a, they called it a rally, but it was a gathering of, uh, of young people to whom a platform full of well-dressed preachers would address. And I don't believe I agreed to do it. And I went dressed. I knew I had to do a tie and all that sort. And I watched these kids as they got in clumps out there in a large auditorium. They didn't want to have anything to do with each other. And they got as far back as they could. And here were these men of the cloth up here trying to teach them. And I could tell they were bored. When they got to me, I was sick. I said, I got up and I said, you know, I, I apologize. I said, I feel so badly. You guys are way out there. I want you up here, but I won't. I'm not going to make you move. That's not fair. I'm going to move where you are. Is it okay? I want to come down front, all right? And I make my way down front, and they're like, and I said, and I'll be honest with you. I am so uncomfortable, I can hardly stand it. Would you be upset if I took this monkey suit off? <laughs> no. So I rip my tie off and my coat, and I'm down there with them, and suddenly they are all, well, what's going on, you know? 
He's here with us. And it so electrified the place. And here is where, if you really don't love people and you're patronizing, it all falls apart. Later on, I heard people say, well, we tried the Gail Irwin method and it didn't work. Because you know what happened at the next meeting? All of these guys, there were about a dozen of them, well-dressed, up on the platform. At a certain point, they all stood up and said, we're uncomfortable in these suits. We want, and they all took them off and took their coats off and the kids were, <laughs> But one of the things that God has taught me is that the ways that you can do away with the barriers and make people comfortable listening so that they, you, you don't have to get over, un, it saves time, you don't have to get over unnecessary barriers. So I look for architectural walls and when you are building your churches, be careful that you do not build walls between you and the people. Sometimes very high and lifted up pulpits. Now, uh, <laughs> There's one, there's a Calvary here. It was built for a musical. The, the platform was built for a musical presentation and they've never healed it. <laughs> and it's very high, very high. And you, I mean, the people who look at you, uh, they, they can go to sleep, their eyes roll back in their heads and you're looking at the whites of their eyes and you feel like you're a thousand miles away from them. And I've tried, I mean, I've talked to them about this and they say, oh yeah, we just never have got around to fixing this thing, you know. <laughs> fix it. So be careful when you are building your buildings that you do not build architectural walls. Make sure, you see this is, a, a semicircle is ideal because everyone feels close. You can get a lot of people and everyone feels close and I'm free to come down and talk to you just like this simply because this is the kind of design that's here. Pay attention to that. Now, after these architectural barriers, you have to deal with yourself. Abraham Lincoln, once when he was replacing a resigned cabinet member and several candidates had been brought to him, their names, he struck out the top one immediately and he says, I don't like his face. And his advisor said, you don't like his face? That's not fair. And Lincoln said, any man 40 years old or older is responsible for his face. <laughs> and I thought, that's true. And it hit me so hard. I was just a young man at the time, probably in my late teens. And I decided that I wanted a face of grace, a face that would say, in the name of Jesus, I like you. Because I knew that if I was going to be preaching the gospel, I would be the mouthpiece of God. I would be representing him. I would be his steward. And I wanted a face that would say to the people, God likes you. I mean, he's crazy about you. Right after me, you're his favorite. You know? <laughs> and I did this and I recommend it to you. I really do. I went into the bathroom and stood in front of the mirror and practice. <laughs> Until I felt, okay, here are some faces that will communicate the grace of God to people and say, I like you and freeze them there so that you always will have it. And when, you, when people see you, they just automatically know he likes me in the name of Jesus. There are other things about the way you use your body that will communicate grace and openness. I've tried to do one here, and you might not have paid much attention to it, but look where I'm standing. I have gradually made my way down. Had I run down, it would have, yeah, what in the world is he doing? Yeah, just some crazy illustration. <laughs> Although I must tell you, I was teaching in Thailand at a pastor's conference, about 400 of them there. I happened, you know, they had discovered how crazy and wild I was and they brought even the teenagers in because they wanted them to hear. But by the middle of the week I had uh, made some mistakes in my eating and drinking and was very, very sick. 
And in the middle of one of my messages, a moment came that I could not <laughs> delay <laughs> any further. And I said to my translator, sing some songs, I'll be right back. <laughs> and he didn't know, so he translates, sing some songs, I'll be right back, you know. <laughs> And I rush out to the back. <laughs> and of course, you know, several years worth of food is dispensed with. And I come back <laughs> I come back in and and they're wondering what was he illustrating? But I have learned that the more I am in true contact with people, however I can do it, either by a motion that says to them that I am not frozen where I am, but I am free to move and free to look at you and free even to get over in front of you if need be and speak is a highly affirming thing to people. And it's a very simple thing to do. It isn't very difficult at all to be that way with people and to look at them and to not move swiftly. Sometimes you have to be very careful with your gesture so that you don't, you know, kind of scare people to, but, but oh, here's the word, gesture, okay. I was uh, I, I on a debate team once and I had a debate guy, He's, he went on to be a nuclear physicist so there were smart people in my school. But I never was able to teach him gestures, you know, and he would have to say gesture and you'd see him. The next point, you know, think, oh man. But, but to be as natural and fairly slow, this is one thing I've learned, to be relatively slow in your gestures keeps people very much at ease. Now, your eyes are really important. Trust me, they are very, very important. For one thing, if I'm looking at you, you're going to keep your eyes open, <laughs> no matter how sleepy you are. <laughs> but I've learned something from children. Children really taught me more about teaching than anyone else has. I cut my teeth teaching nine-year-olds. And if you can keep their attention, you can keep anybody's attention. But one thing I learned is that they respond to your eyes, and they respond to a face of grace. So I learn to, with those children, give them my eyes. And when I'm talking to children, I give them my eyes. In fact, you know, one of my patented things, I'm not going to teach you, this is private, you cannot learn it, <laughs> is the use of my eyebrows, you know. <laughs> oh, by the way, the other subject of this time is how to get wild suspenders. I'm going to let you know that. <laughs> But I learned that children do respond to your eyes and to the face of grace, and they also do re respond to your bodily position. One of the most incredible training moments I had, I was serving in Illinois, actually, and the ladies of our church would have a Thursday morning Bible study and prayer meeting. They would come, put their preschool-aged children in the church nursery, have their prayer meeting Bible study, to which I was not invited even though my name is Gail. <laughs> but I loved those children, so I would take about 30 minutes on those Thursday mornings just to go and play with them. I'll never forget the first time I did it. You know how we build church nurseries, this double door prison thing? <laughs> I opened the top half and leaned over with proper pastoral pose. Hi kids, Pastor Irwin here, let's play. One of them ran in the other room terrified. The rest of them just wandered around. Well, they didn't seem to understand who I was. So I opened the bottom half and walked in and stood among them with proper pastoral pose. Hi, kids. Pastor Irwin here. Let's play. Another one ran in the other room terrified. The rest of them wandered around like, did you hear a noise? Huh? Well, by now my ego was involved because the nursery attendant who was watching this was going <laughs> I wanted to grab one of them and shake them and say you're going to play with me and you're going to enjoy it 
And then the Holy Spirit helped me remember what life was like for me when I was that size and how adults look to me. Giants, man. My world was kneecaps. Immediately, I knew what to do. Without saying another word, I just hit the floor. Hi, kids. And in 30 seconds, every one of them was right on top of me. All right, we're going to play, you know. My hair went one direction and my dignity went another and neither have returned. <laughs> but I learned in that, by the way, that dignity was a wall. I think Satan has killed us almost in saying, you must maintain a pastoral look. Must continue to be a man of dignity. I wish someone, you know, children were very comfortable around Jesus. And I wish someone would, uh, would paint a picture of him with evidence that children have been there. You know, streaks, <laughs> cottage cheese, whatever. <laughs> And he would have had to have given up a little bit of dignity. And he says, whoever wants to be great must humble himself as this child, which does not mean to be childish, but I do believe it means to be childlike. And I have discovered that people will listen to you, even if you decide you're going to give up some dignity for the sake of the children. Well, let's talk a little bit about humor, shall we? Humor, I have heard of it and intend to use some before our time is over, <coughs> is a very dangerous thing. Freud was close to correct when he said humor is hostile. Now think about it. If you tell a joke, doesn't matter what kind of joke it is, someone has to be the brunt of it for it to be funny. Pollock jokes, for instance. Aggie jokes, for instance. What's the new ones? Redneck jokes, for instance. Well, that's the problem of jokes. And this is why I am pretty testy about the humor that I use, because I do not want to make anyone the brunt of a joke, because you don't know who is there. And you don't know how they're going to take it. Uh, occasionally, and you ladies know that, that we do this, one of them that, that I, I thought was costly in some ways where I'd heard it used, uh, where the, you know, the guy's wandering the California beach, finds a bottle, has a cork, opens it up, Jeannie comes out, I'll do anything you want, give you one wish. He says, man, I want to go to Hawaii, but I'm scared to fly, scared to sail, build me a road. Oh, man, I can't do that. You, you just don't understand how much concrete and pavement that'll take. What's another wish? Well, okay, help me to really understand my wife. You know, her emotions and her logic. And the genie says, you want two lanes or four lanes? <laughs> now, the guys are laughing. See? The ladies are... You see, now that is a perfect example of the kind of thing, somebody has to be the brunt of it, see. Now, if you're going to use a joke, and I think it can be done, guess who needs to be the brunt of the story? Yourself. No, don't point at me. <laughs> if you're going to use it, that's what I said. Make yourself the brunt of it. Because you'll discover that if people can laugh at you, they will laugh with you. And if they're laughing with you, they cannot resist your message. It's incredible. Now, life situations are the best source of, of your humor. Uh, li jokes do not translate. I, I speak a lot in foreign countries and they have to translate me. I'm going to Scotland. They're going to have to translate me when I get to Scotland into uh, some British thing over there, you know. <laughs> but jokes don't tend to translate, and so avoid them. But I have discovered that the humor that I do use 
translates in every place I have ever been because they've never seen anybody use their face. Which, by the way, that's another thing to do. Go stand in front of the mirror and think of every emotion you can. Make your face do it. Move every muscle in your face so that your face belongs to you when you get out. You might think that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, and it is, but you will be glad later on because you will discover that you can communicate as much with your face. I uh, took a little child on the airplane just recently who was cutting up, creating quite a bit of problem without saying one word to that child. The mother was trying to figure out, how come you're behaving? Because I just caught his face. I was about three rows behind, and he and I played the whole trip, just with our faces, you know. And then I would peekaboo, you know, and I'd catch his eyes, and I'd point at him, and he'd point back at me, and so Never said a word to him. But for the whole trip, the kid's playing there, and all I needed was my face. So you, it's a good thing to stand in front of a mirror, and if you've got a face, <laughs> make use of it. It's part of the ability that God has given us and for us to be good stewards, and so you may as well make use of your face. But back to humor. Life kinds of humor, where I'm <laughs> making fun of myself or, or describing situations I got myself into that are, that are very funny, uh, people respond to those quite well in every language every ethnic, because human beings are alike everywhere. And so if life things happen to me, they happen to other people too, and other people get into the same kind of situation that we do. So if you are free to say, here is something that happened to me, I can't believe this, and you know, and uh, John Corson does good with that. I don't know if you've noticed that, but he is just outstanding with life situations like that. And they translate into any particular language and to children. Children will listen. Now, another, in terms of communicating humor that way, there is one form of humor that doesn't put people down. It makes them groan, but it doesn't put them down. That's a pun. A word play where, oh, he caught me with that one kind of thing, or you just, maybe it's, it's a passing one that you throw out there, and it takes people four or five seconds before they get it, and you're off on another subject, but then they start laughing, but, but they got the point. A pun is a wonderful thing, because it doesn't put people down. In fact, it's a compliment to them, because it's saying, you can catch this. But the problem with puns is they don't translate either. They will not go into other languages. But one of my favorite methods, which I've tried to been, be illustrating a little bit with you here, is slapstick. Now, you have to lose your dignity to do a little slapstick. I do slapstick with my face, see? The eyebrows kind of thing. The laying down on the platform. It's rare for people to lay down on the platform like that. <laughs> but when you do, the kids are... <laughs> and slapstick with my voice. There's one of the messages that I use from uh, Luke chapter 5 in verse 17 where I open it. I call it Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, it said Jesus was in a certain house and there were Pharisees and teachers of the law from every town. Now I, I emphasize town because most people don't notice that that word every town is there. But the moment I say every town, I have everyone's attention. <laughs> because it's oral slapstick in a way in that I have used my voice in a way they were not expecting and it grabs their attention and now they got to know what is he talking about? Well, I'm glad to go on and tell them, <laughs> but I will continue to do certain slapstick kind of things with my voice that way, and it is amazing how it communicates. One of my most joyous things is how often when I go to different churches, they dismiss Sunday school and bring the kids from about age nine in because they know they'll listen. And I don't lose the adults. You see, this is the thing 
where Satan will tempt us and say, you know, the adults are going to think you're probably not worth much now, you know, because you were willing to do crazy things with your voice and your face and so on. And it's a lie of Satan because the adults will listen to you. And you know what? When their child is seated by them and he's listening, that parent is, that's my kid. He's listening. And they'll love you. They'll love you to pieces for that. So don't be afraid to be just a little slapstickish with your humor. It will cause you to lose your dignity a bit, but it's kind of like crazy for us to think we really have any. I mean, we're Calvary Chapel. Who you th what do you think? How many groups do you think we would impress? How many of the other pastors in town are impressed with you? And yes, which uh, seminary did you attend, Jeff? Yeah. Sorry. You don't look like a pastor. I hope you know that. You know. <laughs> so we've already lost our dignity, and there's no, <laughs> no need to pretend that we haven't. Well, one thing you may have noticed, too, is that I haven't been using notes much. I've been down there talking to you. And one of the things that I have learned about notes is that it's amazing how little you really need them if you'll learn one little secret. First of all, notes are, the, the way we outline things, there are people out there that teach us systems of outlining. And if you have an outline, you have, you've got a Roman numeral one, you've got to have point A, point B, point C, Roman numeral one, point A, point B, point C, and you need to take a paragraph and you need to kind of say, okay, what's the, what's the lead thought there in that paragraph and what's the B thought and C thought and that and so forth. And that's the way we outline things. I don't outline things that way because that's not the way I outline in my mind. When I'm reading the scripture, I do not outline things that way in my mind and you don't either. That is an unnatural way of outlining and that's why you have to keep your notes right in front of you. Oh, let me see, what was point B? Oh yes, and point B here. <laughs> because it is not the way you think. As far as I can tell, Jesus didn't teach that way. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Read his sermons. <clears throat> the scripture really is sort of seen. And I like to teach in scenes because I can remember a scene. If I have kind of a five segment sermon, I turn it into five pictures in a way because this is the way we think. It's the way I think. I can remember a scene. I can remember this room when I leave here. I'll remember your faces when I leave here. Oh, pray for me. I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that to you. But <laughs> yeah, that was, see, that was bad, wasn't it? Right. See, I was violating what I said right there. <laughs> but you can remember a scene, and the, the, the Scripture really is put together that way in many, many places. And if you remember, you can remember five scenes very easily. All you need is about five words to remind you of each one word for each scene, and you can memorize five words very easily, very quickly. Sometimes you don't even need the words. You'll just know, okay, we go from this scene to this scene to this scene. And much of, of course, if you're going to read the Scripture, you just need to read it up here sometimes, but you can also memorize the Scripture a lot more easily that way. And you can teach in these scenes, and it frees you to be with the people. So the real secret is to find out how do you see things and think things and make your outline serve you rather than you serve the outline. Now, that's easier for us to do than you realize because we are Bible teachers who tend to go through passages and verses in order, and so the Scripture itself can become all the memory joggers we need to help us remember what to say. What that will do is free you for what I call 
incarnational thing, and that is being... Jesus chose the disciples to be with him. He was Emmanuel, God with us, and if I am going to represent him and be his voice, I want to be a with the people kind of person, and I want to defeat or conquer everything in my teaching that would keep me from being with you, with the people. So you can be free from an outline simply by turning it into something that serves you because it now matches the way you think and you are able to communicate it the way you think. Well, here is another thing that Jesus used, and I'm amazed that we don't use it more. Can you remember back when I first opened our session together, I told you a story. You remember that? About teaching at this college where we got together and had our luncheon meeting and I'm in charge of the world and all that sort. Remember that? You can remember that, can't you? You could probably uh, tell the story yourself now. Do you realize that the Bible tells us that Jesus never taught without using parables? Parables, stories, are the most powerful form of teaching. Jesus used them constantly. Obviously, in the Gospels, we do not have all of the parables that he used, all of the stories that he told, because he never taught without using them. But they are so powerful. My oldest son-in-law, after he had uh, been a student at, at a college nearby and then followed me on up to a pastorate, uh, which was good because he had my daughter, <laughs> said to me one day, he said, I'm trying to figure out how you do this to us. And he was talking about the whole area of communication. He says, one thing I've noticed is whenever you say to us, let me tell you a story. It's like our eyes are glazed and you have us in your pocket. The story, the parable. Where do you get a parable? Let me tell you where you get most of them, from your own life. Guys, throw away your illustration books. They are so dead. You are alive. Things are happening to you. You have stories, you, I hope you have, from today that you can use as illustrations. Things that someone said to you, things that you saw yourself doing, ways you saw yourself reacting. Now let me give you a secret or two about stories, how to make them really interesting. Because you can put people to sleep with a story. <laughs> First of all, it really needs to be alive. It needs to be one. Uh, this is a happening thing, you know. It either happened to me recently or it's alive in my mind or happened to me today or whatever. I got to tell you about this, you know. And people want to hear it. Of course, if you communicate, I'd like to tell you another story. <laughs> happened to me today then they'll probably go to sleep on you. Because all that you are communicates, you see. But here's the secret of a story. There's a thing called hooks and eyes. Now, that's a, those, those are words that are used from the old day before we had, you know, shoelaces and uh, buttons. And, you know, you'd, you'd, hook, you'd have hooks that you'd put in eyes and so forth. Velcro actually is a, is a method of hook and eye. If you, if you see what Velcro is, it's little hooks. That, but the hook and eye thing is you're telling a story that keeps them on the edge of their seat because you don't tell them the end of it and say, let me now reconstruct this. But instead, you tell them something that causes them to say, ooh, what happened? It's like the old cereals, remember? The guy, is he's obviously about to be cut in two by the saw, and it looks like there's absolutely no hope. And then they say, next week, <laughs> tune in. <laughs> you know, no, 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 tell me. Give me. <laughs> so you want to, in a sense, put the saw there so that, oh. Now, you don't wait till next week to finish the story. 
but you keep people like, oh, there was, it's a little hook that you throw in there. And you say things like, but when he did that, he had no idea what he had just begun. Now that's a hook and I, oh, what did he begin? Well, you go on and tell the story and you can put hooks and eyes in it until finally at the very end, whoa, that was what it's about. And they're with you every inch of the way. The beautiful thing is the hook and eye thing is a means of making them remember. You'd be surprised how with the hook and eye, it helps them remember. Now, here's another thing. This is a secret for your writing too, by the way. One of the secrets of successful writing is it's kind of like writing a mystery in a way. You want to make it so people think, oh, it's obviously right here. You, any of you know if you are spear fishing a fish, you know, you see it here, but it's not there because of the way the, the water bends the light when it comes out. And you have to learn to actually throw over there where it doesn't look like the fish is if you want to actually get the fish. Good storytelling will cause people to think, oh, it's right there, but whoo, no, look at that, it's right over there. And it sort of leaves them with a, wow, the butler did it. <laughs> After all, kind of thing. It keeps a just enough mystery, keeps just enough mystery in their listening that they remember it and they listen. They remember it and they listen. Humor will do that too. I mean, humor, uh, you can't overdo it, as you well know, but I use humor because I've discovered that people remember what they have learned with humor. This was tested by San Diego State University in which they took two different classes. One was related with humor. The other used the exact same material read by the professor, but was without humor. They gave them a test at the end of the course. They did equally well. Brought them back six weeks later. The one without humor failed miserably in their test. Those taught with humor did almost as well as when they had taken the test the first time. So I use it as a means of helping people relax and not resist, because when they're laughing at you, they can't resist your message, and also helping them to remember. And the story is another thing that helps people to remember. But more than that, it helps them apply because they can get a hold of a story. I happen to believe that an illustration is not as much a window as it is a handle to get hold of things and say, I can make this mine. Now, can I move along to some methods of seeing Scripture? I wish everyone could see the Bible through my eyes. You'd want to go back and reread every inch of it and see things that you'd never seen before. Let me give you a couple of secrets of it. Ask certain questions of Scripture, and these are things that you know. First of all, ask it, just what is this revealing to me about myself? And then ask, just what is this revealing to me about God? And you can make lists of that. And then a third question is, what invitations, what uh, what Uh, urgings, what exhortations, what applications is this urging for me? One of my secret things, and if you'll do this, it will just make things come alive for you. I get in the Bible. I become a a person in it. It's not like something I read about and say, hey, that was nice. I get there, and I think, Well, let me give you an example. Let's say that you're in a boat. You're rowing with a bunch of guys that you don't like. I can prove that you don't like them because you fight with them all the time over which one of you is the top guy. Constantly you fight over. You're constantly thinking, how can I prove that I'm better than him? He said he was better than me the other day. He doesn't know anything. And it's all you can do to row in the same direction. Because you don't like each other. The only reason you're together is because you're following the same man. A storm comes up. 
and you have mixed emotions because you don't mind the other guys drowning. <laughs> it's just you don't want to. And there's one particular guy on your boat that irritates you more than anybody else because he is the brashest. He doesn't think. He goes straight from brain to mouth. Named Peter. And lo and behold, you see something walking on the water and it scares you silly because you don't know what it is. It's a ghost, you know, and she's, no, 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 guys, don't be afraid, it's me. Whew. But Peter says, if it's you, ask me to come to you. Now, put yourself with the other guys. Oh, brother. <laughs> Go and get out. Walk. <laughs> From the clue that we have later in this particular story, I happen to believe that Peter couldn't swim. <laughs> that here he would, you know, I, I know people, they live on the water and they can't swim. I, I know people like that. You would think anybody that worked on the water would swim. Not so. I think Peter couldn't swim. And so, go. <laughs> Boy, it'll be a lot better in this boat if he's gone. And he gets out of the boat and he walks. And you're just a bit jealous that he actually did it. And look at that. He's walking. And part of it is you know, boy, when he gets back in the boat, oh, no. <laughs> You guys see what I just did? <laughs> you know what's going to happen. I mean, these guys were human beings, just like us. And of course, you know the rest of the story, which we tend to zero in on appropriately. He got his eyes off of Jesus on what he was doing, and he sinks. Master, I perish! And Jesus reaches down and picks him up, Ah, you of little faith. Which I don't think was fair, really. He hadn't done bad up to that point. Done better than I had done up to that point. But now do you see how by getting in the story, you get a whole different view. Let me give you another one that's one of my favorites that sometimes people just go right by it. But when you get in the story, John chapter 5, Pool of Bethesda, a multitude how many is that? Of sick, blind, lame, paralyzed. We'd call it Congress. <laughs> People <laughs> are gathered around this pool. Why? Because an angel would come at a certain time and stir the water. And now, here's, here's the secret. Whoever jumped in first would be healed. Oh, now put yourself there. Whoever goes in first. What do you think it's like around this pool? It's not, oh, after you. <laughs> There's no fellowship around this pool. No one's in love with anybody else there. But the tragic comedy of it all is, look who's around the pool, sick. I'll be right back. The blind, where's the water? The lame, I'll get there, hang on. The paralyzed. <laughs> oh, 
I mean, one of the saddest places you will ever see in your life. But you're looking at the world. Because we live in a sick, blind, lame, paralyzed world who's desperately wanting to be first. See how it changes everything when you get in it? You become one of the sick people there for a minute, and you think, how, what, what do you think about these people around there? You know, move that foot. <laughs> Paralyzed? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that went on! Because there were desperate people. You can take just about any story in Scripture. And when you get in it, it will become alive and your people will be able to identify with it because you made it alive. <coughs> Back in the early 70s, God did something to me that, for which I was deeply grateful. These were, you know, real Jesus movement days and I had begun my interface with that and God was dealing with me. I'm, I had uh, an assignment by a publishing company to write some curricular material which included the story of the prodigal son. Now that's an inspiring story. I mean you can turn that into a real tear jerker, which is okay. But I thought, now I need to get into this story. Problem was, I've never been a prodigal son. I've been nice all my life. <laughs> I detect a spirit of unbelief here. <laughs> but I've never rebelled against the Lord. And then I realize, yes, I'm in this story. I'm the elder brother. And it scared me <laughs> to death when I realized that all that he was, was me. In some ways at the beginning I resented the Jesus movement. How in the world could God reach those people? Look at them. Look at them. I know the Bible better than they ever will. You know, real easy. And I noticed that they sure seemed to be having a party. The problem was I didn't know how to throw a party. The elder brothers don't know how to throw a party. So you never given me even a goat. <laughs> I could make merry with my friends. He didn't even have any friends. How could he make merry with them? <laughs> the elder brothers don't have friends. They have to have organized social events. Otherwise, they never meet anybody. <laughs> And of course, he refuses to come in. And when I saw that, and the father was throwing the party. That's what hit me. The father was throwing the party. And I got on my knees and I said, God, I want to join the party. I refuse to be an elder brother anymore. And so I joined the party. Everything but the hair. <laughs> but I've done the best I could. But by getting in it, it not only spoke to me, but I was able to write it in a way that I knew would speak to some other people. See, there are two prodigal sons in that story. It's not one, it's two. The elder brother was ultimately more prodigal than the younger brother was. And when you get in the story, you see that. You see that. Any story that you find there in Scripture will change when you get in it. And it will change in a way that will cause your people to identify with it and be able to apply it to their own lives, which is exactly what you want to have them do. And now let me uh, see what I have left in my notes. I happen to be a real friend of visual efforts. See, you've been wondering, what's this up here for, haven't you? When's he going to use this? <laughs> you know? I have discovered that people will remember very little of what they hear, but when you combine it with something they can see, it is amazing how it multiplies their ability to remember because people, when they see things, 
it wells something in their mind. Now, what, would, what did we do? We started off talking about your face in a way. How's it supposed to look? Do you realize that Jesus was the face of God? We find this revealed to us. Whenever you see, uh, well, well, for instance, the blessing from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his, which is face, upon you and give you peace. They literally were saying, because we see this in the New Testament, that uh, in... Uh, in uh, first, Second Corinthians chapter 4, where uh, we find that God has revealed his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, we behold his, we behold his face. This, he is God's face. And God wanted us to see just what he was like by sending Jesus to show us what his face was like. Which is why I want us to have faces that say grace. Just by looking at me that you know grace has arrived. Well, that was one of the first things. Then what did we talk about? We talked about humor, didn't we? And of course, the most important humor is non-joke. Because jokes tend to put people down, and you don't want to put people down. Uh, we, in the course of humor, talked about slapstick. That's kind of, let me put that word up here, because by doing so, you're going to remember it a whole lot better, aren't you? Because now you see it. And even as I go down this simple list, you're going to be able to remember it. Then we talked about such things as using a story. The parable. There are good parables out there that will cause people to really think. I think I have a few of them on my website, and you're welcome to go and make use of them. That's what they're there for. But the story needs to have hooks and eyes. And sort of a surprising ending, maybe. Look at the stories of Jesus, the parables, and see if there isn't a little bit of a, wow, I didn't expect it to turn out quite that way. You don't expect the prodigal son story to turn out the way it did. And it's sort of like, wow, didn't expect that, and so forth. Uh, what else did we talk about? What? Walls, yes, architecture. Let's just say walls, though. I can't spell architecture. <laughs> ah, yes, get in the Bible. Uh, yourself. That, yeah, that, that's not saying it the way I really want you to see it because it sounds like just study harder, and I want you to study harder, but more than that, get in Bible personally. Oh, that's not right either. What's another one? How can I say this? Get into the story. Get in, into story. Very good. Become, become <laughs> character. <laughs> Involve audience. <laughs> Which I just did. <laughs> you see? And you came alive <laughs> when I did. There are some other ways of involving audience that I find. Right? As some of you for whom I've spoken, you know, I will often have people repeat words, sometimes chant things. When I do the one that I call all that God is, the word all... They're going to repeat about a dozen times. And how much is that? Oh. And, they, you know. <laughs> and, and, and I, I thought more of you uh, yesterday when I was talking on, on uh, uh, the, his grace, his face, uh, it, his name. Would get, get right with you, you know, compassionate, gracious. Slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Where were you yesterday? <laughs> Faithfulness, mercy to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. See, you know it because you have repeated it so many times. And it's just something that God is describing himself with. And I wanted you to remember it. So I make you chant it to me and say it over and over. And what else do I want you to remember here? That's probably enough. You're ready to go, aren't you? I am. Uh, no notes. That's right.
And, and you should do that. <laughs> Teach as if you're in someone else's living room. Uh, I was, there's something happens when we take these steps up and be, we're talking conversational, but now it is time for us to begin. <laughs> And suddenly you've, you're not out in the living room anymore. If you talk as if you're in people's living room, it doesn't matter what size the crowd is. They are going to listen to you. One thing that I think is really unique to us, and, and I, I hope we will continue it, when we teach the Bible and when we worship, we assume that you want to teach, that you want to learn the Word. And so we teach it. There are those who assume you don't want to learn it. I must somehow force you. I must convince you. I must use methods on you that are going to make you listen. I have to spit. <laughs> if I don't spit, you're not going to listen. You know what I mean? <laughs> They're getting saved over here. <laughs> but we assume that you want to learn, and so we teach. We assume that you came to worship, so we lead you in worship. There are those that assume you don't want to worship. I've got to somehow cheerlead you. And you know, I guess that's all well and good, but what it is is patronizing. And people feel patronized, like I'm being not taught but parented. I'm being told I'm a bad boy or a bad girl. But if I just get up and example it and learn the Bible with the people, even as I teach it, become confessional. That's one more thing, and I'll quit with this. Become confessional. Be free to say, folks, here's what this scripture is saying, and uh, frankly, here's where I'm not doing it, <laughs> but I want to. And here's how I see it says we can. Let's go together. And, you know, people think, well, if you confess, they'll not, they won't listen to you anymore. They'll talk about you. No, they're talking about you already. <laughs> When you confess, it takes the fun out of it. They don't talk to you about you anymore. And so be a confessional person up there. They will love you. They will not turn away from you. And uh, you'll discover that this is the most... You probably already know this. I'm, I'm, talk, I'm preaching to the choir. I know that. They'll listen to you. They'll learn. And it is the most fun thing in the world to teach the Bible. To make the Bible boring is a crime. If you do it, you should be shot. <laughs> Don't point that at me. I'm not pointing at you. I know you. <laughs> because it is alive and wonderful, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Divides things that can't be divided, but it does. Thank you, Lord, for the fun of being your kid and a mouth. Amen. <laughs>